Hello and welcome to the Recruit Rockstars podcast, where we focus on the people part of your growth stage company. I'm your host, Jeff Hyman. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. And I've done it again for you today. You can thank me later. Our guest not only experienced the growth stage of Google during its most rapid ascent in talent, in HR. She then left and became VP of people at another hot growth stage company out in the Bay Area. And she's lived to tell about it. And over the next 20 minutes, she's going to share some of her war stories, some of what she's learned, how do you do the people part of your business right and avoid making all the mistakes that, frankly, we all make. Her name is Katie Shield. She's the VP of people at Visco. I'm going to let her tell you about the business. And before that, she was, like I said, in HR, in talent at Google. So they don't come any better than this. And with all that, welcome to the show, Katie. Thanks, Jeff. What a humbling intro. I'm so excited to have you on. I've really been looking forward to it. Why don't we start with Visco, just in case listeners aren't familiar with the company. It's V-S-C-O, but it's pronounced Visco. Why don't we start with just kind of what is the business? Absolutely. So we are a mobile app product, and we allow people to create beautiful, professional-looking photos right from your phone. We also have a vibrant global community um, that inspires people to create for themselves and share their own diverse experiences to learn from one another. Our mission is to help everybody uh, fall in love with their own creativity. Our social network is void of likes and comments, so there's a lot of intrinsic motivation for our creatives to engage. Right. And our business model uh, is built around subscription. And the subscription is for the actual creator? Correct. We're consumer paid. Got it. And, and just so I'm clear, so are you really targeting people like me or people that they're kind of professionals, they're making a living selling photos or pictures? Everyone. You know, we started as more prosumer and we've moved to, you know, anytime, anywhere, really approachable um, to democratize creativity. I love it. I love it. And it doesn't take much to understand that you, you take a look at the new iPhone and it's the camera it changes everything. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's unbelievable. You take that to the next level with Visco's tools and you really got something. So I love what you're doing. Uh, you. Just just so people understand, how big is the business in terms of people? Where, where are you based? Uh, we're based in Oakland, California with an office in Chicago as well. We have over 150 employees. Wow. Okay. This time last year, we were 100 and today we're up to over 170. So we've had a pretty rapid growth in the past 12 months. So you'll probably finish 2020 with over 200 people. Potentially, yeah. I mean, we grew a ton, so we're letting our team kind of absorb all right. of that growth yep. Yep. and grow into our revenue. But um, with our business model, the brilliant thing is that we don't need to grow solely through people in a sales team. The product kind of sells itself, and we have a yep. brilliant marketing team It's a team visual as well. thing, right? You see it, Absolutely. share it, and you're hooked. Good. I love it. Let's go to the people part of your business. And I got to start with this question. Yeah. I rarely see glass door scores of this magnitude, just for listeners, you know that Glassdoor is the very first place that any candidate that you are going to talk to goes to check out your company, whether you like it or not. And it's rated on a scale of one to five. And Visco is a 4.8, and not just with two, three crappy little reviews. We're talking dozens and dozens of reviews from your employees, 97% of whom approve of your CEO. What is it that is in the sauce? What are these people drinking? I think. Our employees have a lot of ownership here at Visco, and if the culture's not working, they, they know that they have the power to change it. And so as a result, there's this deep sense of alignment between you know, our mission and why we're coming to work um, and the ability that we make immediate adjustments, recognizing culture, nebulous term, right? But I define that as how we operate. And it's, it's a living, eating, breathing organism inside these walls uh, of Visco. And, our team has a lot of ownership and autonomy to make adjustments if things are not working. And I think with that ownership comes responsibility. So every company says this, help us understand you've been there five years. How, how big was the business when you joined in terms of people? We were small. We were only about 50 people. I joined right after series A. Got it. So uh, what is an example of something specific that you and the leadership team do that enables people to make that kind of contribution and really feel accountability, not just some website slogan, but something that I would say, ah, oh, I get it. Like 
that's going to drive accountability. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as leaders of the company, you have to identify what's going to work for your unique environment. There's not going to be a one size fits all approach. I remember about four and a half years ago, I was sitting down with Joel and Greg, our two co-founders, and we were talking about introducing user research into our practice. And the two of them said to me, Katie, we're no longer building for ourselves. And I said, yeah, no shit. Our demographic <laughs> is 75% female, right. largely international. You two are, you know, guys in the Bay Area. Yeah, right. And um, I started sleeping on it and I was like, why are we building a culture for what Joel and I think is best? How do we democratize, you know, how we operate, what we reward? Uh, we kicked off a core value exercise where the teams came up with their values um, and keep us honest on those. Is so it one across you, the whole company or are there different values by team? By, by Across the whole company, but it manifests itself differently within teams. And I think it's important to recognize that once you get to over fill in the blank number, it's going to be unique for each org. But really, once you get to over 10 people, culture within teams are going to be different. Um, your day-to-day -day experience varies quite widely based off of the team that you're in. And yep. you're going to have to establish those norms for what's going to work with those working groups. So I think the earlier you can involve the people who are responsible for the work, the more ownership they will feel and the more responsibility they will feel. And you see that in our glass door reviews. They know that their voice matters. Yep. You can't fake that kind of ownership and engagement. So I give you, I give you just a ton of credit. Sincerely, it's very, very hard these days, especially in the Bay Area. So maybe that's the next place I want to go is how do you hang on to people? You clearly cannot pay what Google pays. There's always someone that can pay more than you. There's always a shiny, bright object that's sexier than what you're doing. Of course. Uh, how do you, how would you recommend to the listeners to hang on to their best people? I think recognizing you have to play your game and play it your way. Um, double down on what's going to work for you and acknowledge what's not going to work. I took a huge pay cut coming from Google here, you know, post series A, small company, yep. but I was really interested in the impact that I would make. And so we know, like listening to our employees again, we know not only why they come to Visco, but more importantly, why they stay. Um, and then we double down on self-selection process in the interview. You know, we go head to head with big tech companies on a daily basis and the people who choose to join us are the right ones for our company stage. It's self-selects, right? It, absolutely. Right. We also, we don't negotiate offers, which is a pretty interesting. So um, let me stop the presses. I really want to understand. <laughs> Meaning yeah. you give me an offer to join. That's yes. never going to happen because who's going to hire me? But let's say, let's pretend you hire me. You give me the offer. That's it. It's a take or leave it offer. Yes, that is correct. Um, however, Early in the recruiting process, we get to know you as a person, what matters to you, yeah. what is going to be the right fit for you. You know, we want to know where your boundaries are. You're like, shaping the offer around me as a, the, the whole person so that correct. there's no surprise and at the end of the process. We've given people the option, you know, do you want to move a few thousand dollars from your base into equity value based off of your risk tolerance? There's not, you know, huge swings there, tens of thousands of dollars if we're still a startup. Yeah. But I want to make sure if it's the same money out of the company's pocket, that it's going to feel like the most in your pocket. Got it. And we want to make sure that we're giving offers that are going to resonate with the people that we want. And we're starting those conversations, which can be awkward, but we're starting those conversations very early in our recruiting life cycle to make sure there's alignment. Got it. So you mentioned that it self-selects and that people that come tend to stay. That presumes you're doing a good job on the recruiting front. So let's go there next. Um, how do you assess, this is probably the million dollar question, right? How do you assess whether someone is going to match Visco's very unique culture, values, DNA, not the technical skills, the competencies, but the actual, are they going to match and love it there and stay and write great glass, glass door reviews? How do you assess that? How would you teach someone to assess that? Yeah, I think um, we think of culture ad, not culture fit. So often culture fit is code word for, do you look like me, sound like me, come from the same background that I came from? Um, we train our leaders, recognizing that good leaders tend to be very spiky, not well-rounded, but very spiky. We teach our leaders to uh, build a team of individuals who are honestly smarter than they are and who have really strong competencies in areas that they're not quite as strong. 
And so if someone comes in with a baseline of, I want to be collaborative, I am humble, you know, beginner mindset, I'm willing to learn and I'm passionate about what you're building, making sure that they will push you to think differently is kind of that fourth pillar that I would really encourage CEOs to like lean into and hiring teams. How do you, so I get it. Sorry to interrupt. I get what you're looking for. Yeah. I'm in front of you. How do you know if I had those characteristics? I, I couldn't, I just bullshit you and say, yeah. I want to learn. I got a growth mindset, blah, 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 blah. Now you're an expert. You, you could, you got a bullshit detector, I'm sure a mile away, but for listeners who may not do this for a living, right? They're running a company. How do they develop that, that sixth sense? I think on the, the level of collaboration, you know, look for people who say the word we rather than I, when you ask them about their contributions, are they speaking about the others that helped them along the way, or are they the individual rock star? Yep. Uh, newsflash, individual rock stars don't do very well in our culture because usually it's an external pressure to prove yourself yeah. rather than an internal desire to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Yep. So we look for people who give more energy than they take, who are willing to be wrong. Sometimes even in an interview process, I'll say, I disagree. Tell me more about that. Yep. And depending on how they react to that, you know, nudge, you can tell a lot about, oh, interesting. Are, do they start with curiosity or do they become defensive? You're pushing them to see how they respond. Yeah. Do they have an open mindset or a closed off one? Yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's the typical recruiting process look like at Visco? So are there a certain, if I know you, you've got a clear process. You don't seem like you wing a lot of stuff. How many interviews roughly who interviews, who makes a decision, what happens if people don't agree, and what other than interviews are you consistently relying on to assess the candidate? Our interview process really starts with evaluating the current makeup of the team. Again, where are you deficient that you need to supplement? Good leaders are spiky. How do you make sure you're, you're surrounding yourself with people who are better than your current team? So it really is that intake process with our HR team or our recruiter team to understand like what's missing from this group, what skills are missing, what competencies, et cetera, what level do you really need? I think it also starts with like understanding why the position is even needed. So often it's like automatically backfill. Well, we're a lean and scrappy startup. We want to make sure every backfill, you know, maybe something changed since that person left the company, you know, yeah. build for the future, not for today. Yeah. So um, the, the start of the process is really understanding what the needs of the position are so you don't make a mistake in how you're evaluating folks. And then setting up a really well-oiled pre-brief is what we call it. What competencies are needed? How do you ask consistent questions to evaluate those competencies really objectively? What's the right make and model of your like interview uh, panel? What levels do you have? What diversity are you bringing in? So it's a little How bit of go, make... go slow to go fast. I mean, you're really taking the time up front to get it right. And who's leading that? Are you leading that? Or is the hiring manager expected to do that on their own? Our team definitely is here to help provide structure and process. Whenever you have people moving fast and loose, especially around people decisions, you will make mistakes. Yeah. Um, I actually remember when I first came on board, Joel said, hire fast, fire faster. And I was like, Ooh, let's talk about this. And he didn't really mean it. It was just something that he had kind of read and thought, is that the right way to do it? And I fundamentally believe if you take a little bit of time to really sanity check what is needed in a role and create a fair process, you will make much better decisions. And it's much less expensive, much less timely or much more timely to make a good hire rather than make a mistake. You've made your fair share of mistakes. I'm sure over the years, uh, no names mentioned, but give us one that kind of comes to mind. It doesn't have to be a Visco, it could be before, but kind of the worst hire you ever made. And what I'm really most interested in, well, what blew up? So how bad was it? Just so people really understand the oh shit factor. But also, yeah. what could you have identified beforehand that might have indicated that there might be a problem? And what, what signs did you miss? What did you learn from? Yeah, the, I, I won't, the worst hire I made, you know, it's hard to say. I think... The worst, um, the worst hires we have ever made and companies probably will make is hiring great people when you don't need them or in the wrong roles to begin with. And so again, like how do you structure the needs assessment process to alleviate making a very hard decision that no one wants to be in a situation of doing yeah. on the onset yep. um, and spending time really evaluating um, like how, and doing a retro when you're in that unfortunate situation of needing to let someone go, who's quite honestly phenomenal, 
And I think, you know, for your audience members, if they ever find themselves in that situation, my words of advice there is like, people remember how you make them feel. Yep. And if you're upfront and honest in those situations and you give people control over as much as they can control, that goes a long way in forms of goodwill. And so some of those glass door reviews may be from people that, you know, we grew in the wrong way and we had to make adjustments as a business. You know, we're, we're figuring it out as we go. But if you are honest with people and you support them and you recognize that their time with your company doesn't end on their last day, I think it goes a long way in like building the ownership and the responsibility with your current employees because they're paying very close attention to how you respond as leaders in that situation. Yes, they're looking, right? They're really watching. What are the signs that in the past you've missed most often or that the executives you work with have missed most often that if there were two or three things that we could focus on making sure, for example, you said, uh, listen to how they say we or I. It's a mm -hmm. great, great one, right? What other things do we tend to miss in the excitement of the interview process that after the fact we're like, oh man, if I was paying attention. I think some over the years, what I've seen some newer leaders do is hire people who are too similar to themselves. And what you're doing is just duplicating your own skill set. Yeah. You're not actually enriching, you know, thinking about that culture ad or supplementing your spikes, as I call it. So my advice for those newer leaders is ask yourself some hard questions about where you're really deficient and surround yourself with people who are going to push you to think differently rather than just be an echo chamber of what you want to hear. So that means really taking the time to build a diverse pipeline, not just diversity, but diversity of thought in all ways. What is working these days in building a pipeline? It, it's never been harder, at least not in 50 years, to find candidates. And you're in the Bay Area, ground zero for the war for talent. Um, what are the one or two ways that you're finding talent? We honestly, we're pretty creative in how we think about sourcing candidates. Also recognizing that uh, it will take more work, but you can't just go off of, you know, 10 second glances at a resume. You really need to host events in your community. You need to build strong relationships with local organizations to ensure that you're bringing people to the table that normally wouldn't have access or that your example? recruiting team. You, you mentioned a creative approach. Can you give an example that people would say, wow, that's, that's a creative way to find people? Yeah, I mean, we start pretty far downstream. For example, our community engagement is, is really strong. We're based in Oakland and have been. Our CEO um, cares deeply about this community. In fact, he came from this community. And as a result, we have these amazing partnerships with Girls Inc., Oakland School for the Arts, um, right. Camp Real, these local, like amazing organizations. And over time, they say, hey, one of our graduates, you know, would be great. And okay, let's, let's talk with them. Inviting the community into your walls with meetups. Um, we have a strong referral program. However, we ask for people to look at their second and third connections rather than just looking at the individuals that you, you know, the top five that right. again, largely come from exactly your make and model. Yep. Um, and so if you ask people to take the time and think about the second connection, the third connection, you generally will get a wider pool of candidates. And I think more than anything, companies these days are really getting wise to you can't just recruit diverse candidates. You need to then ensure that you have the right level of inclusion once people get here and advancement yeah. from within. Yeah. So we, we actually tend to focus more on that side of it. And naturally, people refer individuals to come. And so our team, you know, we do a BU survey every year. And it's also, again, self-select in, like, employees, you own this place, help us, you yeah. know, understand what we're looking at here. And 55% of our employees identify as people of color, non-white. Wow. And incredible. that's pretty significant for the that's Bay Area. That's incredible. Fantastic. And the, what's the gender mix? Do you know offhand roughly? I do. Yeah, we're 50-50. Um, right. Our leadership team, um, well, excuse me, we are about mid-40s and 5% non-binary. Um, our leadership team is made up of 11 individuals, seven of which identify as female. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It wasn't always that way. We've worked really hard, you know, and I'm I think sure. I'm sure having a have. leader that embraces um, diversity of thought and is really open to hiring people who push him to think differently is important. What does a listener do? And this is kind of how I want to end the conversation. Who hears this? They're jealous. Let's be honest. They're envious. You've described a culture that 
has a great recruiting process, very low turnover, high glass door scores, huge engagement, crazy diversity and scores uh, and gender diversity scores. They, they want to be like you, but they're not. They're not, they're clearly not there today. What is the first few steps that you would recommend the baby steps that they can take to at least start to get onto this path? If you stepped into a turnaround, I guess you could say a culture turnaround, mm -hmm. and you wanted to go from good to great, what are the first few things that you would do? I would listen more than I talk. I think instilling um, actionable reactions to the feedback that you hear is really key. I would uh, firmly recommend that that leader understand what their employees really think of them and be very uh, accepting and gracious when you receive that potentially hard feedback. Yeah. And I would identify like, what are your outcomes? What goals do you actually want to accomplish? Are they genuine and why? Like what business results do you hope to drive as a, you know, as a result of diversifying your workforce or fixing whatever in your culture might be broken? So I think it starts really with the leader, but also understanding like, again, you need to kind of play your game. Like what should be your distinct advantage suss that out and get honest about it and make sure it's genuine because people can see through inauthenticity right away. Yeah. And not every leader is prepared to hear what they're going to hear. You really got to brace yourself because it's not going to be pretty. And if you snap at people or don't respond well, they'll never tell you again. It's and a learned skill. Yeah. And trust me, we don't have it all figured out at Visco. We're learning every day. Yeah. But the moment that you say like, I don't have it all figured out. I said that to the company and my job got 10,000% easier because people are like, she's human. Yeah. And like, we want to, we want to help. And it's yeah. no longer us versus them with leadership. Um, so I think it's about taking a big slice of humble pie and understanding we're all just trying to figure it out as we go. And that's part of the challenge and also the beauty of being at a startup, the impact that you yeah. have. Yeah. That's why people leave Google, take a pay cut to join a Visco and make an impact. Katie, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your wisdom. I congratulate you for building something that sounds remarkable on the people side anyway. Uh, how can people learn more about Visco or get in touch with you? Uh, you can find us on the website, visco.co, and also check out our app. I think we're, we're growing at a pretty rapid pace. Um, I'm really into our business model where our consumers, if we're doing our job well, they're paying us to use our product. I wow. think it's an innovative and new way of developing you know, technology. Um, and I'd love to hear from folks and hear your feedback too. Again, like how do we make sure that we're continually pushing ourselves to get better? I love it. Thanks again, Katie. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your time.